So, um, hello everybody. Um, I'm Mark Walker. I'm your host for the call today, the webinar today. On the screen, you can see uh, hopefully uh, uh, that you're in the right place, how to run an accessible online meeting. And also, if you're looking for slides, um, because the dynamic nature of what we're doing, they've been posted onto SlideShare. You can download them from SlideShare as a full PowerPoint or a PDF. And um, you can go to slideshare.net slash ability net. So I'll mention that again in a moment, but if you wanted slides uh, for any accessibility reasons, then you can get them from slideshare.net slash ability net. And you'll find this um, meeting is posted up there as a, a slide deck and it's available to download. So you can track the um, slides if that's helpful for you. We've got over 500 people registered for today's call. So we'll have a few moments just to make sure everybody's joining us. Um, one thing I want to mention that makes it a lot easier for us to manage uh, the call is that um, we want you to use the Q&A and not the uh, chat as much as possible. The chat makes it harder for us to man monitor. So if you have any questions um, for us, particularly any questions around the content, please use the Q&A box. Now to do that, you'll need to go to your uh, toolbar for Zoom and find Q&A <coughs> and in there you should be able to say, as Trevor just has, that he will use the Q&A box to ask us questions. Just makes it one less thing for us to juggle with at the other end. Um, David Hoff is giving us greetings from Boston, Massachusetts. Hello. And uh, others are saying hi in there. So uh, saw Robin Spinks popped up there somewhere saying, saying hello. Uh, hi, Robin. How you doing? And um, so uh, uh, on SlideShare, somebody's asking about download. I think you have I don't think you have to be logged in to download slides. Uh, I thought it was just available. I certainly set it up to do that. Um, so uh, let's, uh, I'll have to just switch across. You'll lose the subtitles a moment. I'll just check that for you. But I thought that was all, all done. Um, I can't, I'll have to jump out of the slideshow. Just give me two seconds and then we'll start. I, I think the the link is on the slide share. So there's the slide. If you go into that event, uh, you can download. The, there's a download button underneath the slide deck of the actual slide deck we're talking about, and you can choose to download. You have to be logged in with LinkedIn to do that. It doesn't, it doesn't allow you to do it if you don't log in with LinkedIn. You can do that through LinkedIn or a SlideShare account. Uh, so the people who are asking about subtitles will have noticed that they disappeared when I went out of PowerPoint then. And that's because we're using the PowerPoint built-in subtitles for this event. Okay, I think uh, we've got five minutes for people to join. So we've got... Um, over 300 people on already, so that's great. This makes it one of the most popular sessions we've done recently. So um, clearly a topic that people are interested in. I've got some great people for you to learn from uh, with me today. Uh, Adam from AbilityNet, uh, Gizzy from uh, University of West of England, Michael from Microsoft, Robin from AbilityNet, and Alistair from McNaught, McNaught Consulting. Um, I've mentioned already, if you can Ask questions in the um, uh, Q&A box. It makes it a lot easier for us to manage as we go along. And um, everybody is muted, Claire. So Claire was worried about background noise. Um, you won't be able to, you might be able to hear my children actually shrieking in the background, but I'm going to shut the door. Um, but the usual rules apply. We are all on mute, so please use the Q&A to ask questions. Um, and uh, please avoid the chat if you can. Um, just so that we can um, uh, use the Q&A to keep tabs on questions. Just checking a few things in there. So uh, the slide deck has been added to the webinar page on our website, which you can then download from, I think. Is that what you're saying, Sarah? To be able to download it. So 
if you go to our website and find the webinar link for this event, then you should be able to download it from there. It, that's if you don't have a LinkedIn or, or a SlideShare account. Um, there seems to be a serious echo on the sound. I think that might be the only, you might be the only person getting that, Gina, no one else is complaining, so you might need to jump off. Um, your Zoom lower banner can be moved. So the thing we have on the top, if you look in the, um, the settings in Zoom, you can change where the bar appears. Somebody's saying it's covering their subtitle. So mine are appearing in the top of the bar um, and they disappear when I'm not using them. So that might just be a case of, of either hovering over them and finding how to move them, or it may just be a case of hovering away and waiting for them to move out of the way. Um, So there's a question about all the previous webinars being uploaded to SlideShare. Yeah, they're going to be, we're going to go back. We've got most of the ones this, we've got two this week done and we didn't do last week. So we will do that. Uh, just finishing off the questions here. Right. So uh, let's get going. I'm going to ask you where you're from so that we can make sure that we manage this uh, for you. So um, I'm going to launch a poll and I'm going to ask you two things. One is what, what type of organization are you from? Are you from a business, a charity, university? That's the type of audience that we've been attracting. Um, we're very interested just to make sure that we understand what your needs may be. And in particular around the university and HE stuff, there may be certain areas that we want to cover in a bit more detail, particularly given the people we have on the call. And then just an indication just now of how accessible you think your meetings are. Um, we think ours are pretty good. I'll tell you a bit more about what we do as, in a moment to make them um, accessible. Uh, but I'll be interested to see what you think you, yours are. Um, so uh, I can see over 200 of you have voted already. So I'll share this with you in a second, give it another few moments. And I'm <coughs> sure our, our panelists will be interested as well to see you know, where to pitch this in terms of content. Just ticking over the 250 mark in terms of responses. So um, I'm sure that will give us a good indication. I'm just going to share the results with you so that you can see who you've got around you and so the panelists can also see that. So we've got 12% um, from businesses, 26% from charities and 48% from universities. So I think we will, um, where we can, talk about HE. Um, we're not going to delve in hugely into particular platforms, but I do have a question about that in a minute, about the sorts of platforms that you're using. Um, Majority of people aren't sure how accessible they are, which I guess is why you turned up to the, to the, to the session. Um, some, you know, the next highest score is that sometimes some of our meetings are accessible. Um, and then one, two people uh, are saying that they're excellent at it, which is great. Um, please do use the Q&A box to share any top tips because we all know that it's, a, it's a, a, an ongoing journey and not a destination, as they say. So if you, are, if you do feel you've really got this sus, then please do share your top tips with us and we'll pass it on to the organization. So, um, so uh, <clears throat> just briefly to tell you what we, we do, because I think um, obviously most people are, are, are clear, We're, we've suddenly jumped into this online world where um, so much more interaction is going on online. Um, we've got three tools that we've been using for some time in AbilityNet. We use Zoom, we use Microsoft Teams, and we use Slack. Uh, Slack is actually used mainly as a, an internal communications tool within one of our teams, the accessibility team. Uh, they're primarily using that to, uh, they've got channels running around particular work topics, but are also using social network. Um, there's a couple of things that we uh, are important to us in terms of accessibility. And, and it's, I think it's important to say that it's both the front end that's important. So can you actually get in and see stuff? Can you join in with the meeting? Can you watch? Can you listen? Um, can you share notes afterwards? All the other sort of good practice, which we'll cover. But equally important for us, particularly when we chose Zoom recently, was the back end. Um, and any colleagues with any accessibility needs can run meetings themselves. Uh, uh, that, that was one of the reasons we chose Zoom over a couple of other options we had at the time. I, I, I think other options have moved on since then, but we've been using it uh, about 18 months. Um, it's also why we swapped away from the one we had before. Um, and Microsoft Teams has um, got some uh, large numbers of accessibility features, which Michael is going to talk about in a while. Um, and the back end is important to us so that people can run meetings and be productive in the workplace 
without needing anyone to come in and help me set up sessions or run meetings or all the other things required. Um, you're watching captions from PowerPoint and uh, that means the only limitation for us is we can't switch out of PowerPoint when we're on our webinars. We do also have human powered um, captions that we've used in the past and and to be honest the reason we're not using them at the moment is because we're running a lot more webinars than we have and they cost a lot more money and we're in lockdown as most people are and we've got staff on furlough so we've just decided that we'll accommodate the PowerPoint um, sort of constraint um, rather than um, being able to afford to put um, the, the human captions on our experience is the human captions are generally much more consistently correct, but equally that the PowerPoint captions are okay. Um, I haven't made a great job of sharing the slides beforehand. One of the reasons is we usually have a longer run into these events. We've picked up a whole lot of events we're running more frequently. And so the slides changed about uh, 30, 40 minutes ago and I didn't get a chance to share them properly. But that's a top tip that we always use now. We always record everything and we always post it on YouTube. And when you put it onto YouTube, you can have um, captions using the transcripts. Um, we are using otter.ai to use to get transcripts at the moment. You can connect it into Zoom. It's first 600 minutes of free each month, I think. Uh, that's a, an app. Um, you can use otter.ai to get live transcripts as well, uh, uh, captions as well. Although we noticed when we used it the other day that it gets progressively worse at uh, interpreting. It's, it's obviously something to do with the capability of the, the live use of it. Um, so there are various options. These happen to be ours. And you'll hear about some more as we go through. So um, the running order is uh, we're going to look at, um, uh, you've just looked at ability net meetings and webinars, a, a little bit about culture and kit and what you need to think about for doing accessible online meetings. Um, that will be Adam. Dizzy's going to talk to us about the advantages and drawbacks of online meetings and some of the, you know, some of the obstacles which may be in the way of taking advantage of online meetings. Uh, Michael's going to give us a whistle-stop tour of Microsoft Teams and accessibility. There's loads of stuff in there um, that you can follow up on and we'll be giving you links about how to do that. Um, and then we'll have questions and answers. We're expecting to be done by uh, two o'clock. We can run on if we need to uh, beyond that, but that's the timing that we've Given ourselves so please do ask questions I'm going to be um, hosting so I'm clicking through the slides and I'm going to jump over now just to see what's coming in on the Q&A and we'll try and keep up to date there um, with what we're doing somebody's pointed out that the poll results weren't visible uh, I'm hoping you've seen them I'm just going to turn them off now and we're going to get on with things so um, firstly over to you Adam if you could introduce yourself and tell us a bit about uh, accessible online meetings Oh, so, sorry. I, I've just remembered. I dropped another one in. Uh, uh, Zoom. I don't, we got two or three questions saying that people wouldn't attend Zoom because meetings because they're not secure. Um, I just wanted to say uh, we got several this morning, you see, um, which is why you haven't seen this, Adam. Um, it is possible to run secure events on Zoom. There's no reason to not attend or use Zoom, but there are some top tips on what to do. Um, in particular, uh, the um, this is a webinar, so it's quite different to a meeting anyway. You can't hijack this. We're in control of who can speak and what they can say and the, and, and the slides that are appearing. What was happening on meetings, I think, is that people were making them a bit too public and then they were getting Zoom bombed. That was a particular issue. Um, and we found several articles which reassured us, which you may find interesting and useful, particularly if your IT people are telling you not to attend, which we heard about on some people this morning. Um, you know, the way we're running this is secure as far as we're concerned and shouldn't be a security issue for your, your end for attending an event like this. So I just wanted to un underline that, that we have thought about that and that we wanted to make sure you felt comfortable with it. Uh, and then a final poll, a, a second poll, sorry. I'm just going to uh, pull up another one. Sorry, Adam, I, I forgot I dropped this one in. No worries. Um, <clears throat> we're interested in what platforms you're using um, for your uh, meetings. Um, there is a distinction between webinars and meetings. We can discuss that. There are different tools that um, people will be using. But if you can use the Q&A to tell us um, what you're using. Uh, and somebody here has mentioned the service will not allow us to use Zoom as it doesn't meet their GDPR, unfortunately. Uh, as I say, I think this is 
if you're missing out on stuff, it's worth pushing back a bit because we've investigated that. We feel very comfortable with that. Um, and uh, the same with Teams. Teams had some questions about it. Um, uh, let me see. We've got um, there's an there's an, an HE one here, virtual classroom, which worth noting there. Um, Dizzy and um, uh, Alistair Blackboard collaborate. I know you're going to mention something to do with that, Gizzy. Uh, Hangouts and Google Meet. Um, uh, Google Duo. Uh, hang Hangouts has captionings, as somebody points out. Um, Panopto. Skype for Business. A, a fair number of mentions of Skype for Business. I think Skype for Business and Teams is uh, they, they're in transition between the two, but. Teams is, the, is in essentially going to take over from Skype for Business, I understand it. I'm sure Michael can mention that. Um, the issue for us joining would be getting our public sector members to join Zoom if the perception, if it's unsafe. I, I agree about the perception. We've been checking that out. We've been using it for some time. And so uh, I do think it's important to try and get that message over. It's why I dropped that slide in, actually. I don't want people to think that we're not aware of it or not considering it and that we've checked it out and we feel comfortable. And again, just to make the point, the reason that we can say that about Zoom is because we're in a webinar. There are safe ways to run webinars and there are safe ways to run meetings. And if you look them up on um, the Zoom site, zoom.us slash security, it's got some very clear guidelines on how to run a secure meeting and what to do and what not to do, how to make it secure. Cool. So um, I'm going to end the poll. The majority of people on this here are using Zoom or Teams. That might reflect, it might be a self-fulfilling prophecy on the fact that we said that's what we were going to talk about. You decided to come here, but I do think they're the most popular platforms I'm seeing that people are using. And, um, and clearly for that reason, we're going to major on that um, when, when relevant during this session. So sorry, um, Adam, back, back to you. Um, no just to start, uh, yeah, if you could introduce yourself, tell us a bit about uh, some of the core questions that people need to think about. Yep. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Adam Tweed. I'm the Service Development Manager at AbilityNet, and I'm going to be um, just kind of taking a very high level overview of some kind of key um, tips and tricks that you might want to think about when you're hosting um, online meetings and webinars. So a question often asked of accessibility professionals is what is the most accessible platform? In fact, it's a question accessibility professionals ask the accessibility professionals we go to when we don't have the answers. So that's people like Alistair who's on this webinar as well. And when we did ask Alistair which platform he'd recommend, he told us it depends. It's not what you've got, it's what you do with it. The truth is a platform can be incredibly accessible in design, but it's down to the people who use it and the organizational culture within which it exists that make it accessible. It's a whole often greater than the sum of its parts. And that's what the yin and the yang is used here to represent the balance rather than the opposing forces, the people and the technology, the kit and the culture. It's a time like no other at the moment. In less than a month, our physical worlds have shrunk to the boundaries of our houses and yet our online presences are expanding. Even those of us who've, who are used to working from home find ourselves in uncharted territory. We're facing barriers many of us have never had to consider on what will undoubtedly lead to a permanent shift in our working and teaching practices. If we can get this right and work to build the cultural considerations as we build our knowledge and comfort with how we use the tools, this difficult time may yield some real positives. We still talk of accessibility in terms of disability and I wonder how many people didn't consider this webinar because it's supporting disabled people and um, we don't have any disabled people where I work. It's all too common a phrase and yet the simple answer is you do. Whether that be the 70% of disabilities are non-apparent or one in 10 people uh, who have a neurodiverse condition and may not identify as disabled or the one in four people who experience mental health problems. And that's a number I suspect has probably jumped quite steeply recently. And then what about temporary and situational disabilities? Now, I'm very conscious that there's a disabled community out there who are rolling their eyes at the moment and saying, oh, now you get it. Now you've found a use for the non-disabled world. You're all on board and you're all looking forward to these fantastic new tools and, and how you can get to grips with it. Disabled people don't want special treatment. They want choice. 
And when you start looking at accessibility as the ability to work according to personal preference, that's where the cultural shift comes from. Now, although my argument is that cultural and technical should go hand in hand, I've separated the two in terms of tips. So if I just start with the cultural slide first, yeah. So my first point is culturally, don't be afraid to try. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. This is one of the most crucial and difficult cultural barriers to overcome. We get so worried about getting things wrong. We avoid anything risky. And yet that first step needs to have an element of risk. The second point is create a culture of polite correction, or as my line manager refers to it, loving correction. Addressing the awkwardness of knowing you should have said something, but you've left it too long now. It's like the neighbor whose name you've forgotten and now you just make an awkward kind of hello and disappear quickly. Um, in accessibility terms, it's about developing the kind of culture where everyone feels able to say to the colleague who is saying things like, as you can see here, when they deliver a presentation, actually, no, actually, would you mind talking us all through that? It's not about having somebody have to put up their hand and say, I can't see that. Next point is ask your audience what they need, but also manage expectations. And this was lifted from a blog that Alistair wrote um, that I think Izzy's going to go into in a little more detail. But you can say things like you'll provide the PowerPoint deck in advance, but you can't provide an embedded BSL video. And managing expectations also goes to adding value for someone whilst being mindful not to impact the experience of somebody else. You're not going to please all the people all of the time. I thought a great example of this was last week, we, we ran a, a Zoom webinar. Um, Zoom, as we've heard, is a reasonably accessible platform as far as we're concerned. But as Robin explained to us uh, all the other day, the chat tends to be read out on a screen reader and can't be selectively muted. Chat is a great feature for people to interact with without being placed on the spot, ask questions without feeling that spotlight. But for Robin, when presenting to a large engaged audience, it's an almost constant stream of distracting conversation. So his solution, which was entirely cultural, was just to ask people not to post in the chat during the bits where he's speaking. And then the, my final point on this slide is providing content in advance. If you want to tap into the skill set of a workforce, this is a straightforward and easy win. It's not always practical in terms of people sticking to deadlines. As we've heard today, things do run over, but generally allowing people to have content in advance allows them to prepare, enables people to participate, provides, no, uh, sorry. No worries. <laughs> it provides uh, a buffer against technical difficulties um, and allows people to focus on a speaker. So the value of a meeting or a webinar should be when a, in what a speaker is saying. And if this isn't the case, then maybe you might want to question whether delivering the session is worthwhile. And yes, I did just look and see if there was a drop in the participant numbers on that one. Then moving to the technical. So just shift on the slide. Use captions. Do I need to be deaf or hard of hearing to find subtitles useful? What if I'm looking after children? Do I abandon the meetings as I yell at them for, to be quiet for the fifth time, or do I just read the subtitles? I have a situational hearing impairment, and accessible content will assist me with this. And the cultural shift just requires someone to click a button to start the subtitles. You can even toggle it to display the subtitles by default, so it becomes opt-out rather than opt-in. So that's a nudge that tends to work very well with humans. In fact, do my subtitles need to be in the same language as I'm speaking? No. PowerPoint has an add-in that can translate a speaker into over 60 different languages, and these can be followed along on the individual's device. I could be delivering a presentation in English and have uh, people following along in the language of their choice on their smartphones or their tablets. I have a friend who works for an international aid organization who's used this feature to speak with an international team of, docs, uh, of doctors out in Africa. She said it wasn't perfect, it was having the odd pockets of laughter around the room as a different word was misheard in a different language and translated uh, to something amusing on the screen. But the technology was good enough to give the briefing. It was an accessible personal choice. Next point is use your camera. It's only uncomfortable until it's commonplace. You might feel a bit self-conscious, but for many people, it's a key element of connecting with others. Figures vary hugely, but I've seen studies that say anywhere between 55 to 93% of communication is non-verbal. Now, it's not essential. 
it's often the studies are more to do with how we communicate on an emotional level rather than conveying information as we do in webinars. But facial expressions give cues to engagement levels. They're also great ways to see people trying to participate who'd normally be drowned out in a phone call. And it's also a great flag for technical difficulties when somebody starts pointing and gesturing at their faces. Next point uh, is to use a headset or a decent microphone. Clear audio is key. It's key to allowing people to hear you, obviously, but it's also key if you're using things like the subtitling. And use the mute feature as well. We've all had that feedback screech, the heavy breather, the slurp of coffee or the background conversation that's as difficult to ignore as the person on the train who's having a phone call. Some people are able to filter out this distraction, but for others it can be a really significant barrier to thinking straight or delivering content. And then consider the tools for participation as well. Extroverts speak to think, introverts think to speak. And it's common in face-to-face -face meetings for introverts to remain quiet. Now online meetings may provide individuals with greater comfort in terms of location, but also formats to express themselves. So you've got the chat pane, the inbuilt Q&A. Um, in, pl in platforms such as Google Slides, you've got uh, an inbuilt anonymous Q&A that you can use. We've also used Slido to allow people to post questions and to upvote them for answering. So that becomes quite a nice kind of collaborative piece with an audience. And Mentimeter as well is a great visual tool for gathering feedback that may help audience members or meeting attendees to contribute in a way that they simply wouldn't be able to do face to face. But again, that's visual and it's not gonna suit everybody. It needs you to consider that content and explain what people are seeing. And that's my bit, and I think it's Gizzy next, or back to Mark. Yes, um, I will, let me, I'm just gonna pick up on a couple of questions um, mm -hmm. that uh, have come in there, Adam. Um, uh, what, uh, first one was about BSL, and I must, must admit, I, I, I know we talked about this in, in AbilityNet some time ago, um, but we, we, it's mainly a reason of cost that we haven't added BSL. I'm sure that means we're excluding some people. I don't yeah. know whether you've come across anything or any of the other panelists have done anything around BSL about including, um, and also one of the questions is what, what was, what does BSL stand for? Um, so the British sign language, um, of course, using video means it is possible to include it. Um, but I don't know whether you've got any thoughts or experience of doing that or anyone else on the call. There are services that will, um, like a dial-in, uh, you can get a BSL interpreter if you're running online meetings. Um, there are also people who are saying that there are AI and um, kind of avatar-based BSL, but that's something to be very careful of because obviously there is far more to BSL than just the gesturing um, of hands, there's facial expressions and that sort of thing that we're not at a point where any kind of automation would be able to duplicate at a, a reasonable enough level. Okay, um, and I want to just look at um, another couple of questions here. You said speak to think and think to speak. And somebody's yes. asking if you could clarify what you meant by that. Um, that quite often extroverts will uh, form their thoughts as they are speaking. So they'll, they'll go through a train of thought as they are talking out loud and putting um, thoughts together. Um, introverts like myself and being put on the spot with a question like that is in panic mode. Um, and I would need time typically to kind of process what's being said and then say, uh, what I wanted. So form the thought in my head and then speak it as opposed to forming the thoughts as I was talking them through out loud. Cool. Um, I'm going to mention uh, a couple of technical things that we've said in passing that just to reiterate, we're using uh, PowerPoint uh, AI driven captions. They do contain errors and we do tidy those up in the transcript. To get the transcript, we use a piece of software called Otter AI um, and that um, we found is very accurate and you can connect it to Zoom and it will go and look at the recording of the Zoom uh, session and produce a transcript for you and that gives you the chance to then quickly and easily go through and edit out. Somebody the other day um, was talking about motor neurone disease but unfortunately that turned into motor urine disease. It's a very simple example. Um, so that's, you know, most robots are going to get caught out by that sort of stuff. So yes, we do tidy it up and, and it is helpful, I think, because there's often a lack of clarity. Sometimes people talking on top of each other can confuse it as well. Um, Mark, it's also worth uh, noting that another approach is when you've recorded it, upload it as a YouTube video, 
YouTube will do the auto captions and you can then download a transcript from the auto captions in YouTube. It's a very yeah. quick way of working. We actually, our slightly more Rolls Royce version is we upload the transcript, which it then uses for the captions because otherwise it has the same problems that we experience in this one, if you see what I mean. So we transcribe the recording and upload it with it, with the video to YouTube. It takes the transcription and uses those for the captions. So it's a slightly reverse engineering on the, on the other way around. So it does both ways, yeah. Um, I had another question. People have mentioned a piece of software that I hadn't come across, Jitsi Meet. And I just wondered whether that was an education related thing or whether that's, has anybody else come across that as a piece of webinar software? I haven't. Uh, we're not going to be able to go exhaustively into everything. I can see other names on here that we will talk about. I just wondered if it was something in particular in the education sector. Cool. So um, thank you. I, uh, uh, thanks for that, Adam. And, and I think it's important to bear in mind that, you know, what we're saying here is there may be tips and specific uh, ideas for particular pieces of software. But I think the approach that people take um, is always going to be uh, the most important starting point rather than which platform am I on and how do I get the captions to appear thinking about how you connect with people and make your work accessible is very important um, culturally and, and, and not just in terms of the technology. Uh, so Gizzy, can you introduce yourself and tell us a bit about um, the advantages of online meetings as far as you're concerned in terms of accessibility and some of the drawbacks they bring? Great. Hi all. Um, I'm Gizzy. I'm a learning technologist at the University of West of England and I'm a serial participant and sometimes presenter creator in online meetings, webinars, web conferences, as well as obviously as part of my job online learning. I'm also hearing impaired, dyslexic with Erlen syndrome, have carpal tunnel and a permanent spine injury. So as you can probably tell, I'm quite old if active. Um, so where are we? A digital world, okay. So uh, let me see. Oh, apologies, I seem to have lost where I'm at. So um, the power of the web is in its universality. Access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. As said by Tim Berners-Lee, inventor of the web in the 1990s. I seem to have lost my slide access here a second, so I'm so sorry, please bear with me. So, Accessibility is essential for all of us to function in our digital lives. Pursuing accessibility, though, as I see it, is an act of enlightened self-interest. Access to information and communications technologies, including the web, is defined as a basic human right in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. However, in the COVID crisis, we have all acquired multiple disabilities on top of our existing ones. And we need to continue to pursue accessibility through universality in designing our meetings, our webinars, our online teaching and business interactions to be inclusive. Are online meetings, webinars, conferences, teaching and learning accessible to all? Not generally. In my area, in the education sector, we've mostly shifted to teaching online very rapidly. But this has been the very opposite of the kind of planned migration that we would consider best practice by digital delivery experts. In our rush to ensure that students could continue their studies, it is likely that the needs of some students and staff, specific learning needs, disabilities and external factors have at best been put aside if not forgotten. So access to facilities on campus to support are now inaccessible. For example, supernova enabled screens in the library. Add to this that most staff, students, workers and businesses will now be disabled by situational and or temporary factors due to the pandemic. So the next phase of the pivot to online will be unpicking where the mitigations and alternatives need to be put in place to ensure that every student can continue their education during the lockdown. This is going to require all of us to focus and work together on addressing the inevitable barriers created in the first emergency responses to the pandemic. This shift is also a factor in aggravating the stress, anxiety and general mental health burden of living in the reality of the pandemic and lockdown. Many are reporting experiencing exhaustion, stress and confusion resulting from a surfeit of online meetings, webinars, conferences, learning and teaching. I had reports of people doing eight to 14 hours a day for some who are both studying and working, for example. 
virtual meetings and conferences and learning are actually very demanding multitasking. They're made more complex and exacting in this situation without the usual subconscious cues that we read in our everyday office or classroom or lab working environments and without the mini breaks built into those forms of interaction. It's also exposing inequality of access experienced by many, such as tech solutions available, households competing for priority access to power outlets, connectivity, physical space and time. Added to this, we all need to remember many will be ill or caring for ill family members or for children at home. Many will be grieving and many will be volunteering in key roles. So we cannot assume that our learning session or meeting is anyone's priority in this situation. So Eileen Hopkins, who's director of AI Media, has pointed out that COVID-19 is to some extent leveling the playing field between disabled and non-disabled employees, as workers must find a way of accessing content remotely, attending meetings and having their voice heard virtually. And again, digital solutions come to the fore and provide a way of keeping business going. The same could be said for some aspects of teaching and learning. However, there is a real danger of the recent gains in focus on digital accessible practice being lost to the rush for the second wave pivot of online teaching and learning to online assessment and an uncertain September start to the new academic year. Not all participants will have the same access requirements as each other i.e. not all deaf or all blind students have the same experiences. As web host, whether a chair or a lecturer, you need to communicate with participants in advance so that they understand the specifics of their requirements and experiences and provide them with appropriate support. I'd like to highlight some of the positive benefits though to online interaction for accessibility, as well as some of the possible drawbacks. Whilst platforms and tools have variable accessibility standards and functions, in my experience, the common issue is the lack of focus on how it's used. That's what causes the greatest number of access issues. So benefits. Equal access to speak, voice or question is so important in a learning environment. Via text, via audio, via video, live in advance of the session or post session. This all requires pre-planning of your sessions and facilitators or buddies. This allows diverse participants to be supported by personal preference and choice in modes of engagement. It also allows you as host to manage equal access to contribute and question and fostering an inclusive culture with the aim of extending and perpetuating into hopefully future face-to-face -face events. Asynchronicity, giving flexibility, allows pre-submission of questions, agendas, scripts, or lesson plans, resources, and allows chairs, presenters, lecturers, sharing minutes, agendas, actions, presentations, and notes in advance, and post-session links, resources, and extended reading. Everyone benefits from this, and this is fundamental to just plain and simple good practice. Agility, the ability to respond to requests and queries and search across the, the web live and doing that collaboratively, Beware though that too much of this can create really complex sessions which can be very confusing and distracting or bewildering and difficult to keep up with. This can have impacts on access for motor impairments, neurodiverse, vision, hearing impaired, inexperienced online users and those on mobiles. Captions, as has been said, are crucial and a captioner or a palantypist, audio description and sign-in picture, BSL interpreters, all of these are important, but not always possible. Auto captions at the very least are essential functions. Many more of us will need to use this as an accessibility issue. Poor audio setups in our home working environments, noisy environments and very large busy meetings. From a personal accessibility viewpoint, I have to say I find Teams meetings far more efficient and productive than the face-to-face -face meetings I have to attend at university. I can use the captions, I can track the conversations, who's speaking. And, and yes, it's not 100% accurate and it does provide amusing errors, but it really helps me keep on top of it and keep track of it. 
Uh, Blackboard Collaborate is a tool that we use in HE quite a lot in, in my university. It doesn't do auto captioning, but it does have a designated role for a captioner, a human captioner in live events. And these are much more accurate than auto captions, as has been said, generally about 99% compared to autos 50 to 70%. That, that tends to drop with specialist lexicons and accents and poor audio quality and background noise. However, as has been said, it's an expensive, highly skilled job. Um, and it's something at the university that would only really be done for a specific participant's need. Um, however, Collaborate has a benefit in that it can record the chat as well as recording the video of the live webinar session. Recording for review makes meeting interactions much more accessible for all as we concentrate on the meeting. We're not relying on our short term memory nor on scribbling down indecipherable notes in my case or missing half of what is said or demonstrated or shown. Accessible platforms and tools. Most of the bigger platforms address some accessibility issues and have a range of features and it's changing all the time. Microsoft Teams, Blackboard Collaborate, Ultra, Zoom, etc. are very popular in education. Inclusive practice. Many of us with accessibility requirements have been working remotely on and off for some time. And actually this can feel quite isolating. Web interactions actually give us the opportunity to be much more inclusive and much more human. Video close-up of faces as speaking. This is a big one for me and for everybody who has trouble tracking uh, audio. It's essential for many of us and many on the neurodiverse spectrum also benefit. It can help us with focus, processing information, emotional engagement. Ideally, participants could manage what, when and how they receive and interact with this session. Flipped learning, an old, old educational love. Um, reserve your online time and meetings for real learning. Work offline or through working documents, discussion boards, wikis and chat systems before you all contribute to a brief online meeting. It's much less stressful, much less vulnerable to technological issues um, and much less bandwidth demanding and tech demanding on your remote students. Audio quality is really crucial. It's superior if participants can use a headset. Headphones reduce computer noise, distraction and background noise. And we can't do that in a face-to-face -face meeting. So it's a definite advantage of online. Okay, so that's the benefits. When it comes to the drawbacks, technological inequality. Ooh, sorry, can you still hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Yep, lovely, sorry. I just accidentally hit my mute button on the headset. Uh, drawbacks, technology. Technology inequality, oh, I can't speak now. Not everyone will have access to a computer or a decent sized and capable tablet. Headsets, microphones, apps and software, broadband or Wi-Fi. You need to bear that in mind and think about that when designing your interactions. Digital skills. During our accessibility training workshops, the biggest single hurdle to overcome has actually been the enormous range of digital skills levels amongst staff. And I know from my teaching years, it's the same with students. Large meetings definitely are a drawback. They're as unwieldy and difficult in face-to-face -face as uh, they are, sorry, on the platform as they are in face-to-face. Some platforms have a limit to the numbers that can participate. So we've got a really big audience in this one. For Collaborate, as I understand it, it's 250. So we wouldn't all have been able to attend the meeting. In teaching, we tend to use mute all mic and video by the speaker for big sessions and have very set rules for interaction in the chat with scaffolded pre, in and post session resources. Where we have a student unable to use chat, we generally try to work one on one with them and do some research and how best to substitute for that, whether that's alternative document formats for the recordings or another process. In Collaborate, you can actually use breakout rooms to create smaller groups to carry out smaller meetings, working on a problem and then feedback to the whole meeting afterwards, which we find very useful in teaching. 
So assistive technology compatibility with platform tools is a fairly frequent issue and some are not very navigable like keyboard, which I would consider a really basic requirement. For staff and students with visual impairments using screen reader JAWS and Microsoft Teams, which we use at UE, um, Freedom Scientific, the creators of JAWS, have just released um, some support material for Teams with an audio walkthrough, all the various keyboard shortcuts. There's generally a bit of hassle for screen reader users with any platform that involves sharing screens, but Teams does seem to come out best on this, so I've put the link into my notes. Um, it takes time and repeated sessions for people to get familiar enough with online meetings to be as efficient as face to face and, and it's happening, but it's taking time for staff and students to get overall familiar with it. We're fortunate at UE in that we have a long history of providing online learning and distance learning. So some of our faculty have actually been pretty quick to make this transition, but other areas are, are slower and it's taking more time. Potential service and networks overloads in current situation is something we're all tracking. So Microsoft did themselves some, make some tweaks to the 365 platform to maintain levels of service under the increased demand and announced that back on the 24th of March. And other service providers and platforms have similarly made statements to the same effect. So where you can use other means or at least minimize bandwidth use where necessary, do so. Um, inaccessible content, please, please use Microsoft's Accessibility Checker and Blackboard Ally if you have access to Blackboard, although Blackboard have now released a COVID-19 open and public access version for that. Screen real estate being too busy, sometimes there's too much content or too many interactions or the platform layout itself is busy and not responsive on mobile devices, which is a big issue for us as many of our students only have access online through their mobiles now that they're locked down at home. And the big one, audio and interactions, poor quality, audio, 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 always the first consideration. So tips for accessible online meetings. As we referred to before, um, Alistair's guidance in his 2016 blog for JISC on the three Ps, plan, present and post follow up. Prior to this session, agree an agenda, a lesson plan, rules of engagement, so crucial to the smooth running. Always do this, have a no risk practice session. If it's one of a series of sessions that you're going to do in teaching, always give them the chance to have a fun and playful session just to get familiar with the platform. Focus on the audio quality in and out. It is the most important. Set up the face so that it's well lit. Now I recognize that this is really difficult for us from home at the moment. None of us are in an ideal situation in terms of setup, but it's so important that we can read your expressions, engage with your humanity and feel included, not to mention lip read or face read. Hide any screen clutter and blur the background if you can, or check what's in view behind you. Most tools now allow you to check before agreeing to switch on the webcam. Use the notes in PowerPoint. This is essential to have access to the notes. People don't want to be taking notes. They want to listen to you, watch you. Use accessible documents. Really important to use Blackboard Allies. Opened up access to uh, their tool, which you can now use no matter whether you have Blackboard or not. And I've put a link to that in the notes for you. Uh, it allows you to convert your documents into formats that might work better with your particular assistive technologies, your mobile, your study tools, or your just per your personal preference. There are also open access resources and papers for teaching and learning and textbooks like uh, OpenStax offerings. Many students have lost their jobs in the crisis and have little or no supporting income. So there's a series of webinars being hosted on this by the OE or OER for COVID panel, and the links to all of these are in the slide notes. Keep your slides simple and share as open, unlocked, editable files so that users can adapt to their preferences. And buddy up, it helps to, make, to manage sessions and be responsive to questions and issues. And always have a backup plan. All sorts could go wrong, technical issues, last minute cancellations, even an oversubscribed meeting. Ask your participants for input. 
ideas, for feedback about what worked, what didn't, and give them the choice to do this anonymously and record the meeting. Where appropriate, having, having informed everyone in the pre-session comms and again before you start recording. Blackboard Collaborate, you can allow participants to be anonymized in the setup of the session so that those that get anxious about contributing can be freed from worry. So there are all things to consider. Things not to do, don't use inaccessible documents. And that includes things that are behind paywalls that are locked or encrypted. Keep alerts and email and Skype open. Don't do that, keep them closed. And please don't do, this is a personal plea, please don't swivel or rock in the seat in camera view. My boss makes me nauseous every time we have an online meeting. <laughs> and don't require participants to sign up to or download apps or tools or web apps, especially if it requires disclosing personal data or use of specific operating systems or device types or doesn't support keyboard controls for navigation. Sorry about the blurps and the little blips there, but that's all of me. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you, Dizzy. Um, um, we've got lots of questions and stuff coming in, uh, but interestingly, very few of them are to do directly with what you're saying, because I think it was so clear. It's really, <laughs> really obvious, actually. And, uh, and the one very obvious one is that your notes will be shared. And obviously, yeah. you were reading from notes, as you said, in terms of prep. And uh, that will be um, available uh, as part of what we share afterwards. And um, uh, I'm just going to pick a couple of things up here. Um, you mentioned uh, the black board um is that spelt blackboard or black b-a-u-d are there did somebody just ask that uh, to clarify the it's spelling black, of it? it's blackboard b-l-a-c-k-b-o-a-r-d blackboard uh, it's one of the biggest um, blackboard ally it's one of the biggest vle um platforms um lots of higher education institutions in the country use it but as part of blackboard um they have bought a separate company called Ally that produces, it does a lot of what the accessibility checker does. So it will check a document with a automated in, uh, algorithm to identify certain types of uh, accessibility issues. Um, but it, what it will also do is offer the user or the student or the staff member the opportunity to download that same file in an alternative format. So for instance, you could have as a tutor uploaded a Word document and a student could think, I don't want that, I can't read that. They can then choose to download it as an MP3 file, which is quite a popular one because lots of people like to listen to it on the, on the bus on the way into university or, uh, but for a lot of us, it's essential, that alternative. And it can do that in a number of different, from a number of different file formats to a number of different file formats. The thing to remember is if the original isn't accessible, then the alternative format one won't be either. So you still have to practice good accessibility in writing of the original document. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> There's a, a note here about downloads. I just wanted to confirm something. You say don't ask students to download, but they will need to download Zoom. You don't actually need to download Zoom, and it's one of the reasons we chose yeah. it. Interestingly, from our point of view, it's because we have a lot of clients in the corporate <laughs> sector who yeah. couldn't join our webinars because they needed to have a yeah. download we were using go to meeting before webex yeah. has the same requirement yeah you can actually <laughs> join zoom through the web and i think um that i think i know lots of other platforms have that facility as well so you do lose a little bit of functionality and interaction sometimes depending on what you're doing in the in the event i'm not yeah. sure polls work through the web for example but um that's just to clarify from our point of view and using zoom it was one of the things that we chose it for is it's lightweight easy to access yeah. um, and, and you don't need to do a download Cool, so I'm um, going to move on. Uh, speaking of Microsoft, wouldn't it be great if somebody from Microsoft was here <laughs> to talk to us about accessibility? Oh, look, is there someone? <laughs> this is where we introduce Michael from uh, uh, Microsoft. Michael, can you tell us about your role and then tell us a bit more about Teams and, and how to use Teams in an accessible way? You're muted as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, sorry, I saw two microphones and... Uh, now I clicked on the right one. So, um, so, so what do I do on Microsoft? Uh, may, maybe two things here that could be relevant. On the, on the one hand, I'm the chair of the employee, re employee resource group of employees with disabilities at Microsoft UK, uh, which kind of makes me somewhat 
linked with what this actually means um this the impact of this meeting uh of this webinar so a great session so far i find uh i i feel like i don't have to put everything add anything anymore i could just leave but that's not why you asked me here i suppose uh in in another part of my life uh i'm the uh, services lead for accessibility so so microsoft of services so i'm there the lead for accessibility on that level so what, what i'm trying to make sure is that when we do our products when we deliver our services that that is that reaches everybody uh in in the population not just 80 percent but uh, everybody so uh making sure that we include people with disabilities in in both our technology and and how we deliver our services so that's my key part of my, my day day role um, and we mentioned teams already a couple of times. Shall I just uh, just crack on with a couple of slides I have now? Yes, please. Um, so uh, no introduction slide here for teams. We talked about teams. I'm just going to highlight a couple of features and teams. Um, do I have control of the slides now? Is no, that... you don't. I'm okay, afraid. cool. Uh, so we what, so a couple of features and teams, uh, as you may know, it's a it's a collaborative interface where you can collaborate, where you can chat, where you can talk, when you do video conferencing, where you can share your desktop, where you can share applications, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and and as such, it's for us now the the go to tool to all collaborate while we're working from home, um, and that's how we were already collaborating at Microsoft, uh, whether we were in the office sitting next to each other or where we were in Costa Base or, or, or in, a, in a coffee shop or what have you. Um, but there are some features there uh, and there's continuous more features, which is inspired by the people with disabilities working for us. Uh, so they, that they say, hey, we would like to have add this and this and this. One of these is Immersive Reader, uh, which used to uh, which came up at the time amongst our portfolio as a hack, where a specifically targeted towards people with dyslexia. But basically uh, what it also does is that ultimately, and um, yeah, I don't have a, where do I need to click to move this a little bit forward? Uh, an animation, with, ah, there I see it, yes. Um, so when you are in Teams, for example, and you see somebody chatting, there's some text coming up, you can open up for yourself Immersive Reader and it will provide an interface which might be, uh, for some of us, more easier to read. It focuses on the text, it can highlight as well. Uh, you could read aloud it if you wanted. So uh, in fact, some of us use read aloud just to to check what they wrote, to check whether the pronunciation is, is, is okay. Uh, personally, I use read aloud uh, to, if, if I've been confronted with too much text, too much learning to do, at some point I just like, oh, let's just, just read it out to me. Uh, so I get a different way of input. So, so as, as somebody already said here, it's about choice. Uh, doesn't necessarily link to a disability, doesn't necessarily link to uh, people who are neurodivergent, it's sometimes it's it's often about choice, uh, and and to allow you to be as productive as as can be. At the same time, the immersive reader also has an inbuilt dictionary. So if 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 the language is not your first language, you can see a pic uh, a picture of what a particular word means. Uh, so. Uh, some exotic words or concepts, then uh, a standardized picture will come up trying uh, explaining you in a pictogram what, what it means. So no particular dictionary needed there as well. So just moving on. And the bottom right, you see that there also can be focus. Immersive reader can also give you focus. Uh, so you don't see the full text. Another feature in Teams, um, we talked about captions. The, and uh, somebody asked about, can you turn captions on or off? And, you know, I, I get it for some people, captions can be distracting. Um, in Teams, it's a personal choice. You can switch on without anybody, without having to ask anybody, you can switch on for your personal use, whether you have captions or not. So this is self-empowerment. And nobody needs to know whether you are using captions or not. Uh, so that that's... Uh, 
in Belt uh, that's going to be released very soon. Not everybody has this yet. Uh, I know that was a question. Another thing that you can actually do and that makes your meetings also more accessible and actually give them some longevity as well, because not always everybody can uh, attend the meeting, especially now that we're working from home, that child might just be a bit too loud. And apart from using captions, you actually have to uh, get up. Actually, it's actually much worse when they're really quiet. When they're really quiet, then you need to worry. Uh, so you have to get up and <laughs> go see what, what, what your child has been up to. At that point, uh, if you can also record, that's even a better uh, accessibility feature because people can then watch back at their own ease. Uh, and again, that's in build there as well. When you record it, it will upload it to streams and make a transcript, uh, which then again will generate those captions, but you can edit the transcript and play it back. So, uh, so for later on. Um, and I'm clicked for the next slide. Uh, there you are. Many people have probably uh, remember this uh, this gentleman where I think he was uh, somebody, he wasn't quite a report, I think he was a diplomat reporting on how the situation was in the country that we were speaking about. Uh, and then in the background, um, one of his children was joyfully walking through and doing all kinds of stuff. And then uh, that, that seemed to show that the person was actually having a real life, uh, <laughs> which I think, you know, what. Uh, 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 this is diversity. We do have real lives. Um, but, you know, we did introduce blurring and uh, the ability to change the background of the speaker as well. Now, you, why is this important for people who are for have hearing loss? They, it makes them easier to focus on the, the speaker and they can focus more easily on lip reading uh, of the speaker that has actually a feature that was recommended by one of our engineers who was deaf uh, that she said can, can we uh, can we add that to the features um, again the bottom right drawing shows a bit on how that happens uh, also at the other thing about the being mentioned about your boss swiveling too much on his chair again that will reduce the impact of, of background stuff happening uh, so again, you can focus on the, on the person giving the presentation. At one point, we, we also had a question about sign language, uh, a feature that is there for some of us already, it will be ubiquitous at some point. If you have somebody doing sign language during the session, uh, you can ping that video and have that present all the time in the forefront while you're looking at the, the, the speaker or the, or the material being presented in Teams as well, which is kind of a neat feature uh, uh, when you want that. So that's a bit about that. Uh, just checking another question. I talked about uh, um, recording. Now, and this was mentioned as well. Um, this you, there you have a, a collaborative platform where you can chat, where you can have video, uh, where you can share pictures, have the captions and all that kind of stuff. But at one point, it is about collaboration as well on uh, electronic digital documents. And by all means, if you want to have this an accessible experience, then make it truly accessible. Use the accessibility checker, which is throughout the platform in Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote, Outlook, and Visio. Uh, do use the accessibility checker. It makes it really easy uh, to use, makes it really easy to become a subject matter expert on, on accessibility. It tells you what needs changing, tells you why it needs changing, if and when you're interested, and also helps you very rapidly to, to fix things. Uh, so so by, make, make that uh, digital material, that those digital documents accessible. Also, when you leave the meeting, when you produce those, uh, collaboratively produce those documents, you do not know where those documents are going to end up. Uh, so that could be somebody who's colorblind, uh, could be somebody with loss of vision. You do want to have your content uh, accessible. You want, you want your content to be read, right? Uh, so, so, so think of um, that there are people who just want to work differently out there in the world. Uh, make sure that you 
you know, fully you reach 100% of the population. Michael, I just um, got, I, I took the liberty of just showing people what I did when I checked the accessibility on this, um, you know, this, this presentation we have, because uh, we run that all the time. Um, so that was why there was an that's good there on your screen. did i okay. did i leave one behind <laughs> no 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 this was no i added this one in <laughs> uh, okay <laughs> and just before you come to your useful links i just think it's useful to highlight this I, I i think the accessibility checker we discovered this on a session you and i were on a couple of weeks ago i think is a little known feature and you notice turning it on and leaving it always on there's just so many things that come to the surface when you do that uh that people will learn from and i think um, it was worth just reiterating mm, how valuable mm. that, that tool is to help people learn about accessibility as well as just making sure your documents are accessible. So, you know, we're big advocates of people using uh, that tool as a commonplace thing in everything that they're doing. Um, mm. so, sorry, and, and then this is back no, to the no. slide. The useful so just in case that you say like, wow, so much information, how do I take it all in? Um, this is a slide I quickly made with a number of links. Uh, on there, you will have a very uh, interesting blog on remote working with lots of other input in there from a lady with hearing loss of a, um, an interpreter for sign language. Uh, so lots of information there. F do follow up blogs uh, because we do know that this webinar is now really of interest. Looking at the numbers here is amazing. Uh, we're going to come out with a blog on education soon uh, in this context. In this context, I mean, not just general education. And uh, there's, a, there's going to be a blog soon around accessible uh, meetings as well. So big meetings, uh, big session meetings, like virtual events. That's what I mean. Uh, if you're generally interested in accessibility features, there's a link there as well. Uh, there's our main site with lots of guides. If you just want, you know, bite-sized uh, two-minute videos, there's a link here at the end, uh, which shows you where you can rapidly get access with captions, also on little videos, two-minute size, uh, to to rapidly get you up to speed, or also, you know, just give to your your employee base and say, hey, if you quickly want to do some good practice, here, here's here's an idea. And there you are. Great, thank you. Um, you may or may know that not know the answer to this. Uh, which languages the um, translator works in and whether it includes Welsh. Because yes, it, Welsh. It does language. Welsh. I check it. <laughs> it does check. I don't know all the languages. Uh, I could open up PowerPoint and just go enumerate them, but that would be quite boring, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, but it does cool. do Welsh. Yeah, cool. Well, I mean, as I say, I think that the answers are in there. Um, the other thing, I've just noticed a few people in here. Um, I'm going to mention it now just because we're slightly overrunning if, if we continue to dig any deeper, but uh, people on the Q&A are putting in helpful pointers about what Teams Checker does and all sorts of stuff. I, you know, we're, we're very conscious that uh, lots of people on the calls clearly know a lot about accessibility. One here is just saying that, um, just going to pick an example of what we're looking for from the participants if we can, uh, that the Alley Checker so Accessibility Checker doesn't pick up where heading styles haven't been used, unlike Ali, which I guess is the Blackboard one. So if you've got tips like that, we can share those afterwards. I, rather than go through them in detail now, I think the point we're making with Teams is that it's got uh, captions in it and other things. It's clearly got some other things that don't work as well. One of them in here is uh, being able to focus on one screen, which is the pin thing that my, Michael is mentioning. Um, and so we will um, share all those links afterwards and potentially move in to do something a bit more detailed in the future uh, around the, those questions that have come up that we haven't been able to do. So we, um, we, it's a good point that the, the, the person is making there. Uh, if, if, if that's your, uh, I mean, on the one hand, you have accessibility checkers to make sure that the, the, the person producing the digital content is accessible. Uh, kind of what you say there is a really good point, but that would, could potentially make uh, the person completely having to rewrite the document as well and things like that, thinking more of style and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, we are looking somewhat into that on making sure that the, the order is good, for example, in presentation PowerPoint. But what if you really want to do this, uh, check out the accessible templates. So whenever you create a new document, for example, in PowerPoint and things like that, type in accessible, uh, choosing the template and you will get an accessible template. Same thing with words. So on that sense, you would already have the, those styling features in there. Um, so, and that's for, I would say the people who actually know what they're talking about. Great points. Great. Thank you. Um, and, and equally, I, I, you know, I do want to emphasize that 
Um, one of the reasons we're asking you to use Q and A box is not because not only because it reads everything out on the chat box if you're using a screen reader, but also we can keep track of the stuff we haven't answered just as much as the stuff we have, and we can give that a go. And if you are posting in chat, please do copy questions across to the Q and A before the end, just so that we don't lose that. We do track the chat, but we really are interested in sh in sharing answers as well. So. Um, so uh, I've just, um, I'm just going to pick a couple of things up. There's a couple of platforms we haven't mentioned. If you've got questions about platforms that we haven't mentioned, now's the time to put them in the Q&A. We'll see how many we can get through. But here's a good question. How accessible is Google Classroom? I'm going to ask Gizzy or Alistair to see whether they've got any direct experience of using that. I haven't got direct experience, as Alistair here. Um, the thing that I do know is that there's a, I've got a link that I'll pop in the text chat pane. Um, no, I'll pop, yeah, I'll pop in the text chat pane or, or the question and answer, whichever is the best place. Um, there's some really good accessibility slideshow that Google have done that goes through the accessibility of lots of their different products and uh, hardware as well as software. So I'll pop that link in there. Um, it consists of lots of elements. Google generally are trying to take accessibility um, just as seriously as Microsoft is, for example. I think every big provider is realizing they have to. I'll put that link in now and that will give you some ideas at any rate. Great, thank you. Um, uh, then I also did find out what uh, is it Jitsi is. I think it's called Jitsi, isn't it? Uh, where is it? Um, Andy mentioned it, Andy Romsey, thanks Andy for that. There's an open, uh, one of the platforms we hadn't heard of before, it turns out that's an open source platform that we can um, refer you to. Not fully accessible at the moment, it says, but people are working on the accessibility features of it. Um, there was a question about whether you do need to download the Zoom app before you join this meeting. I thought you didn't. I will check again and see whether we've maybe configured in a way that prevented that system. I don't know. It's a really good point. I'm blithely assuming that we had it set up that way. We may well have ticked the wrong box, very much down to how it's set up. Um, I'm just picking a few other things out in here. And if you have any last questions, please do drop them in. Um, setting up a meeting in Zoom, how to involve blind people with no smartphone or webcam. Uh, uh, you can use the audio for Zoom only. I mean, you don't have to have the video. We're, Another thing that hasn't been mentioned, actually, we do this in terms of presentations. We're very conscious that we always explain what's on the screen, even as much as you say you can see here, um, it's still necessary to say what you're actually showing people for those people who can't see, whether or not they're dialed in perhaps, or just due, due to their um, vision uh, impairment. So um, that's just a good practice in terms of presentations um, and equally important on meetings, of course. Uh, Anything else in here? Um, Michael, can you just confirm which version of Office do you have to have to have Teams with the captions? It, on mine, it, it tells me that it's not available in all countries or something like that. I'm not 100% sure what the messaging is, but um, it, it, is it? can you just confirm which where it's currently available okay. to have a live caption? I, um, so I don't, so I can tell you which version I'm running. I'm not, I'm not sure which version. I think, I think uh, it's the current version of Office 365, but I don't know where yeah. the territories. Uh, but that's that's not necessarily everywhere yet. Let me try to find what version I'm, I'm running. Uh, da, 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 da. So I think we can. We'll put. We'll we'll, we'll answer that yeah. afterwards because I think it's there's probably a standard message somewhere on the web on the website. I, I believe it was territorial, you know, as in it was brought into the UK at one point. I got yeah. And I got it, and then it depended what your license was. Your mm. Office three six five. Obviously, if you have a full license, then that should if you would expect that to be working. Clearly, that's what we've got. So um, yes. Uh, Cool. I think I'm going to uh, call that's what it there. Is. I just want to, um, okay. if I can move on to a poll, I'm just going to find out how useful you found today, please. Um, uh, this is, um, uh, I've been sharing that one. I'm going to put up the, uh, how useful it is. We hope that you found today useful. Um, I, we sometimes have some loose edges around the ends of our webinars. Uh, we uh, we typically take six weeks to prepare our webinars, and we've been doing this one since Monday, I think. So I firstly want to say thank you to everybody who's presented, because 
um, it's been an incredible uh, sort of amount of detail and resources shared and also just point out to people that we will continue to develop these resources uh, the, the live webinars um, we've got a series called ability net live and um, what, that's where we're bringing together our stuff around uh, COVID-19 in particular because whereas before we were running three webinars once a month most most of the time we're now putting them in weekly um, we're doing our best to respond to questions that people are asking us and this was a really important one uh, accessible online meetings leaped out the last time we ran a session um, we will continue to ask people uh, and do what we can to respond and you can look online now at abilitynet.org.uk slash live and you'll see uh, a program of webinars that are coming up which I'm sure we'll continue to add to. Um, the other thing that um, I wanted to mention is we have training. Some of this is paid for but we are making the introduction to accessibility free so you can go to our website and book a place on our next training course called Introduction to Accessibility and that's free. The difference between a webinar and training is that it's delivered by a trainer, it's structured, it's got learning outcomes, it's not got panelists in the way this has. Um, and there's a maximum number of people we allow into it. So that is a, 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 a limited offer. I think it's 30 people um, and it's available for free. It was just put online yesterday. So if you are interested in an introduction to accessibility, then go and have a look at that now. We're also doing how to do your own accessibility testing and how to understand accessibility. <coughs> Go and have a look at abilitynet.org.uk slash training. You'll find a sign up there for our courses. I wanted to drop in some good news because we was on a meeting this morning earlier. We're definitely going ahead with the Technical Awards. If you haven't looked at that before, this is our awards that we run uh, to celebrate the ways that tech is being used to help make the world a better place. I know there are loads of examples um, in the current emergency where people are sort of getting together and doing some great stuff. Loads of 3D printing things I've seen, for example. Um, we'll be announcing uh, details of that. It will start in May. The uh, uh, nominations will open in May, but, um, but that's just good news. I think I just wanted to share some good news. And finally, AbilityNet is a charity. So um, in terms of what would, you know, as everybody is at the difficult times we're going through, if you are able to help us and support us, please do donate. Um, some of our court services are paid for. Our paid for services are all still operational. You can still um, use us for accessibility testing and the HE accessibility services that we offer. Are still available and um, we do we, we do generally work remotely anyway so it hasn't made a huge difference to our teams in terms of day-to-day -day work but it has having an impact on our income um, and particularly our income that supports our free services so if you've enjoyed it today or thought it was useful or have anything that you can spare to keep it ability net going then uh, slash of donate there's various ways you can give us your support so a uh, huge thank you to Adam uh, Gizzy Alistair and uh, Michael um, and uh, Robin for supporting the event today. Huge thank you to you for joining. We are going to record, um, uh, we're going to share the recording sometime this afternoon. You should see it up online by tomorrow sometime. Uh, we will share the Q&A, we've got the notes, all the other materials and resources you've heard about will be out there on the internet within the next 24 hours. So um, please do um, uh, check up on that information as it comes out and please do feel free to share it of course to the people who weren't able to come here today. Mark, so, thank you, everyone. Any sorry, Mark, could I, I just add in also for those who are from a specifically educational context rather than some of these other contexts, I've just put some information in the chat pane because I'm running a webinar on inclusive webinars uh, for Education Training Foundation tomorrow with a very strong emphasis on education um, rather than the whole world that we've been looking at today. Cool. Could you drop that into the Q&A as well, please, Alistair, just so that we don't lose it, because then it can go into the answers for the questions. So. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, great. And uh, Gizzy, you've shared some stuff there about uh, COVID as well. I, I can't see what that link is, actually. It just says O-E-R-U. Um, Hi, sorry. That's um, uh, Open Educational Resources in the EU they're running a series of webinars specifically related to education challenges and use of open access for teaching and learning um, and the one before was the Blackboard Ally open resource so people who don't have Blackboard can use Ally to generate alternative format documents with that. Okay brilliant great um, and thank you Michael huge thank you to Microsoft obviously Microsoft has loads of interest in, in, um, in sort of sharing knowledge around accessibility checker but I would flip it back to our community as well and say let's make sure people are using features that are into those in those mainstream 
tools and uh, share that out as much as you can. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. And we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Mark, I couldn't put it in the question and answer session because yeah. I think I can only oh, answer people's panelist. questions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. I had the same thing. Yeah, uh -huh. sorry about that. Um, so I've got it in the, it's in the text chat. Yeah. Uh, it, actually, it is in the, uh, it's,